Hello, I'm Dana Tyler. Breaking the stigma about mental health. It's extremely personal and not something many people open up about. But every year, millions of Americans face the reality of living with a mental illness. Talking about the struggles and journeys people go through can help open doors and break the stigma around it. And that's exactly what our CBS2 anchor and my friend Cindy Shu is doing. I spent some time speaking with Cindy, talking about this, her mental health journey. And she gets personal about what she's gone through, how she found help, and how she's living differently now. A warning that we talk about some sensitive topics involving mental health and suicide. We hope Cindy sharing her story can help others know they are not alone. You have decided to talk about something very personal, mm -hmm. and the timing is no coincidence. In perspective of what we're all going through. Well, mental health awareness, and also what we've all been through for the last year and a half with COVID, and everyone feeling vulnerable and isolated. So I felt this was a good time to share my story your story, um, a lot of people wouldn't have the courage to do this, mm -hmm. but you feel it's important, and we're gonna go back a few years, which tells us one thing, having a story dealing with mental illness, depression, anxiety, whatever you wanna call it, comes any time to anybody. It doesn't pick a season. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so explain how you led into it, and what made you realize there was a problem? I didn't really, well, it was in 2015. Mm -hmm. And I think the first sign to me was having trouble doing my regular job, everyday reporting, going out in the field. It's very fast paced. My mind was moving slower and I was it was just harder to do just the simple job I'd been doing for more than 20 years. And then I remember one story, simple story, but my heart started beating so hard in the, um, in the truck, in the news truck, that I told my camera person, Mike Muskoff, I said, I have to go to the emergency room. And he took me immediately to the emergency room and you know, they did all sorts of tests and breathing and, and the doctors couldn't find anything wrong other than, you know, high anxiety, um, which was it's kind of uh, frustrating because you feel like you don't know what's wrong. And there was really uh, nothing to do about it. I, was, I wasn't told there's anything to help with that or, or what caused it other than, I don't know, sometimes I feel like the stress of our job and the content of our job um, you know, murders, um, talking to uh, children, you know, who've lost family or just anything. It, it gets to you after many years. And I think that was just one of the things that was making my heart race. <sighs> the pressures of the job. Yeah. Um, it's the story that, you know, they always, we feel what is happening to the people we interview. Um, but there's a time pressure and a time management to get these stories on every day, which includes the interviewing and the writing and the editing and whatever challenges there are of that. And I guess in the, our heads, approval, be it a boss, be it the audience, be it yourself, you don't want to let down your photographer. How much, too, was that part of the pressure of, can I get this done? Can I get this done? I think it all whirls into one big tornado. And what happened was I, I learned that I had, I had, I was in depression, I had depression. And the thing I've learned is that it's not one thing that causes it. It's like a perfect storm of many, many things. Um, and it's different for every person. Did you, like when you went to work that day, the day before, a week before, what were you feeling like then? I mean, it wasn't a light switch. Right, no, no. I think it was, looking back now, I was just anxious. You know, maybe not not looking forward. You know, I, you know me, Dana. We've known each other for 
a million years and I'm like the happy person at work. Always. So to not feel um, positive and just to feel very different than you normally do. Um, that was one thing, but it wasn't so much that I felt like, oh, I need to get help. It just, you know, I'd never experienced feeling like this, but it, I, I knew nothing about it. So I just, you just keep pushing on and pushing on and doing your job and being a mother and trying to keep your life together. Did you think asking for help was like, no, that's... That didn't, you know, I didn't even consider it because I didn't, first of all, I didn't know that I was suffering from depression. I had no idea. Um... And it wasn't until, I mean, it, it was a process, you know, from the emergency room to I think it was several weeks later, just continuing to do your job, but anxious inside, but trying not to show it. Um, Were you able to do that? I have to say, I don't remember. Yeah. But, but you have the ability, you do isolate yourself at work right, if right. you want to, mm -hmm. right? So they're your coworkers, your teenage daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you deal with that? Does a fake face you're putting on or I think crying it's, in a, when you right. can, running somewhere private? I think it's a, just dealing it, dealing with it by yourself, as I have to say, can be a cultural thing as well. You know, coming from an Asian family, we don't talk about things like this. You don't sit there and say, I'm not feeling well, I feel down. It's more like you don't want to be a burden to anybody. So you just kind of keep it inside. My daughter was 11 years old at the time. So, you know, she and I, of course, aren't going to talk about it. I'm not going to share with my child what I'm going through. But what happened was, um, I believe weeks after that first visit in the emergency room, I just kept going back to work. And then one day, one of my colleagues she said, are you okay? And it must have shown on my face because you keep trying to hide it and I think I'm pretty good at it. You know, I'm pretty good at putting on the happy face. Mm -hmm. But I guess she saw and uh, she said, can I talk to you in the hallway? And we went to the hallway and she said, are you okay? I said, no. And that was the first time I actually let down the wall. And that's when she said, you need to take some time off. Yeah. And I said, yes. And I left work. And I left work for months. And no one knew why. Mm -hmm. And after that, I, I did go to, um, you know, I, went, I asked my mom to come. Uh, I'm, I'm a single mom, so it's just me and Rosie. And I started feeling like uh, I was struggling at home as well, yeah. not being the good mom that I normally am, you know, wanting to go home and just go to sleep and pull the shades down, get in bed, stay there. Yeah. 24 seven, if you could. Exactly. So she came, she came to stay with me and I don't, still, we didn't know what it was, you know, um, we still weren't open about talking about it. It's just that I needed a break from work, wasn't feeling that well. And, uh, then it, I just kept getting worse. So doctor, uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, yeah. somebody, I mean. I, I looked into, I had talked to a doctor. I mean, it helped a little bit, but I still was, was bottom line, I attempted suicide uh, weeks after I had left work. You were by yourself? by myself. My daughter was away at camp. My mother was at a museum, you know, so I knew I was by myself. And uh, I attempted and the hope was I wouldn't wake up. And my mother found me and I was, I have no memory mm -hmm. of her finding me or anything like that. My first memory is waking up in the emergency room mm. and uh, realizing I wasn't mm. dead. Were you relieved or were you sad, confused? I think I was confused. I was confused. Um, probably embarrassed. 
you know, because it's something I hadn't talked to with family. Um, and then uh, stayed in the emergency room to come back to life. Went to a hospital to um, physically get better. And then I ended up going to a psychiatric hospital. Um, and that's where I really found the help I need. Yeah. I, they have psychiatrists and group meetings where you're with other people who have suffered the same issues you suffer from. And you can talk openly. I can't tell you how much it helped to have group meetings yeah. where you're sitting next to people who say, I know how that feels. Because, I mean, when you think you were alone throughout this, even the little bits of information you might have given, but mm -hmm. you're giving him, giving that to people who, as much as they can have compassion and, and empathy, mm -hmm. do they really know? And, and, and whether or not they do, you can, nobody understands me, and, right. and I'm going to just soldier through this. So what was it about sitting next to a person who's, who's saying, hello, my name is, and I, I have X, Y, or Z. How did that make you feel better? Like it made me feel better. It made me feel like you're not alone. Mm -hmm. There's this whole group of people who are going through some sort of mental health issue, whether it's depression or whatever the issue is, and most of them had uh, attempted suicide as well. It's just a safe place. It's a safe place that you feel like you're not judged and you can open up and you're in a place where you can get help. What happens with depression for me, it's like a black cloud takes over your brain and it tells you that the world would be better without you. Mm -hmm. And for me, it told me my daughter would be better living like with my brother who has a wife and three kids and more of a traditional family versus just me and, and Rosie. But, so that's what, that's what depression does. It kind of warps what you're thinking. And it really makes you believe that if you are gone, it will be better for the people you love. So that's what it felt like. Did you feel that? Even though you felt it would be better that she would have a hole in her heart and that the pain did you not think you were worth it your life was worth it to her how did you reconcile the pain that she would live mm -hmm. with I think the power of the depression that tells you adamantly your daughter will be better off. So yes, you think there will be a little pain, obviously, but you're not thinking straight. So you're thinking, um, my child will have a better life um, without this messed up mom who has depression and can't, and can't climb out of a dark hole. That's what it feels like, you're in a dark hole. What about, I'm wondering, we're on TV. Yeah. We're telling stories that of all ranges, but just on the side of it is we're there. Our faces, the presentation is important, so we give the story. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, you can hide behind that. Mm -hmm. But obviously that just gave way. Did, in, did that play into it of what the responsibilities of your job or you were failing or you were becoming transparent? Well, I think part of it is we're in a very competitive business. And I think I always had in the back of mind the fear of losing my job if I didn't, if I wasn't at 100%. And if I lose my job, I cannot take care of my child. And then everything falls apart. And that's what was happening. Um, it's a fear, which I think is the depression that creates this fear in the back of your head uh, about everything falling to pieces. So that was the way that I think uh, the pressure of work 
you know, connected. You spoke earlier about um, being Asian American and talking about it, not talking about it. You're involved in the Asian American community. Um, a sense of responsibility that you have, I know. And I'm wondering, too, about that and being open to them. Um, if how big a decision that was. I mean, you have begun to share this before mm -hmm. this interview here. When was it that you realized, I've got to say something? I decided on a panel. It was for uh, it is an Asian American journalist panel to share this story because we were talking about, I don't know how to make it through this business, you know, which is tough. And what I found was... When I first opened up, so many people talked to me afterwards about how either they had felt that way or they had a family member who had been through mental illness issues. And it opened a door. It opened a door that is shut right now to so many people. That's one of the reasons I'm talking, because we need to open the door. So then I started to get more involved. Then I. Um, started getting involved with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and they have a walk. So I took part in their walk uh, with my daughter and a friend, and that felt amazing to have so many people who were going through the same thing. Um, whether it's they had gone through depression or someone they knew or a friend, or even how do you handle it when somebody else, you think somebody else might be going through this. And then the next year, they had asked me to, you know, they asked different people to go on stage and hold certain bead colors. And, and the beads mean, um, like white beads mean, if uh, you lost somebody to suicide. And um, green means uh, if you've experienced it yourself. And so that was a big thing, to get on that stage and hold those beads up. And to see all those people, it felt it felt like you were doing something. Like you experience something, you go back in your hole, you um, just keep it a secret. Uh, I felt like it didn't really help anyone. Because what you learn when you go through this is that so many people are going through it, but they're doing it in secret. You know, after I was in the hospital... Um, How long were you? I was in the hospital for... I, believe two weeks one location or one location and it's uh you know it's one that's it's a lockdown you don't get to go home you sleep there you uh phone. it's uh -huh. no no they take your phone there's a phone on the wall that you can call but it's scary it was scary going in there and that's one of the reasons i think we need to talk about this when they said, we think you need to go to a psychiatric hospital, of course, as a journalist, you want to say, okay, well, what's it like there? You can't find any information about what it's like there. Mm -hmm. You can go on websites and, uh, like, different hospitals that may have be a psychiatric hospital. There are no pictures. There's no description. It's basically you're brought in and you're left there and you have to stay there and you can't just leave which is really scary. So I was very fortunate to go to a hospital that I feel really helped because of all the experts, the mental health experts, and, and also all the other people that were there that were going through the same thing were just as helpful. Was it also that beginning, though, when you're there, you're just alone with all your thoughts mm -hmm. and boy, you can build, you know, I, I messed up this, I messed up that, I messed up this, I don't think I can do that. Um, that, that line between beating yourself up and giving, giving yourself, being compassionate, giving yourself permission to love yourself. How was that? I mean, it, it took those experts to, to help you to get there. Yeah, it took the experts to explain that Mental health is just as important as physical health, whether it's cancer or diabetes. You do something immediately, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But mental health, uh, no one talks about it. So a lot of people are suffering in silence. So it takes the experts, it takes treatment 
to get better and to recover, which I'm doing, I've done. Um, and it was medications, it's talk therapy. And I continue to do that. I continue to see a psychiatrist every month. I'm still on medication and I need that. But I feel great and I feel so many of us can, um, can recover from, from depression and, and mental health illnesses. Did Rosie know and how did she react? Rosie did not know. She, uh, again, she was 11 years old and when I went into the hospital, I would call her from the phone that we were allowed to use sometimes and we would talk, but I would just tell her that um, mom's at a mom's at a place I'm taking um, art courses and because there there was therapy, art therapy and music therapy and things like that. And she was so small. She didn't really, you know, ask those probing questions. Thank goodness to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of pretended mommy was away for a little bit. But after I had finished with the hospital, after the hospital, then you go to kind of a step down program where you continue with the group and you continue with different doctors, but you get to go home. Yeah. And that was for weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah. In the middle of that, I had asked them, how do I handle this with Rosie? And they said, well, it depends on what your relationship is with your child. It's different for everybody. Well, I've always been a very open parent. Yeah, you are. You know, mm -hmm. just lay it out there. And so I got advice from child psychologists about how to tell her. And one day we just sat down and she didn't even ask that many. You know, I said, is there, do you have any questions? And she said, no. And it was weird. I mean, I think sometimes as an adult, you think it's going to be, uh, your child's going to have more questions than they actually do. Um, and then I, I did also say if you want to talk to an expert about this or if there's any time you have questions and they also told me to make sure that she knows that my illness is not her job to cure, that I have a team of doctors and I have so many people working to make mommy better that your job is just to be a kid, you know? And we're getting better. As she's gotten older, though, she's become an advocate. No kidding. No, I'm not surprised. <laughs> she's your daughter. <laughs> of course she is. I mean, she's gone on the walks with me. Uh, she saw me hold those beads up. Um, I share with her um, anything that I'm doing as far as talking about this. Now she's 17 years old. She's in high school. And she's been dealing with this for the last five years. She has now been able to help her friends, her teen friends, because talk about angst and issues, teenagers, and especially during this time. So she's now the listener, because I think one of the biggest things you can do is listen and listen carefully to people's pain um, and don't just swat it away. Uh, so she is now a strong mental health advocate. You must be so proud. I, Another reason to be so proud of her. I'm proud of her, and I just am so grateful that uh, she's my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get back to also just being diagnosed, and some will feel, oh, what a stigma. I've got depression. I can't let anybody know. It's not a stigma. It's not, but when you're going through, you feel like it is. When I was in the step-down program, so I still was gone from work, nobody knew from work what was happening with me. I was just, poof, I'm gone. I can attest to that. Yeah. I had no idea. I, I didn't communicate with anybody. Yeah. Um, and in the step-down program, these are, you know, we've been through treatment. We're all getting better. We all had a whole workshop on what are we going to say when we go back to work? Because none of us are going to go back to work and say, 
I was going through depression and I attempted suicide and no one's going to be honest about that. It took me years to be able to talk about this openly. Um, and it's a growing process and I just hope that other people will open up as well because going through mental health issues is not a weakness, you know. If you get a physical ailment, it's not a weakness. And it's the same with mental health. It's just you can't see the scars. Do you find that when you look at people or when you're having conversations with people, I'm just wondering with what you've learned, are you, it's not being a, a judge, passing judgment, but is your compassion, your heart is bigger? I'm more aware. Yeah. You know, I, I listen for, if somebody says to you, um, I just want to disappear, or I'm such a burden, or I just want to give up, you know, just different things. Now a red, a red flag goes up, and I talk more about it, and I want to hear what they have to say because on the outside, even when I was going through this, I think everything looked fine. You're one of my dearest friends, and you didn't know, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think everyone, most people are really good about hiding it. And that's also what I learned through this, is that no matter how good somebody's life looks from the outside, you know, they could be going through hell yeah. inside. Yeah. You talked about those things, too, when you hear certain things. And, and what about lifestyle, too, of, you know, mm -hmm. recognizing things? Um, maybe not showing up for work mm -hmm. or um, not exercising, yes. not eating well because you don't care? Well, for me, it's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. But having gone through treatment and being now able to recognize my signs that I'm not doing well, uh, it would be I stopped exercising. I used to exercise four times a week. I was a spinner like crazy. I loved it. I stopped. I um, wanted to sleep all the time. When you pull the shades, you just want to be in the dark and you want to shut everything out. Uh, and you just see big personality changes. Uh, also, you know, one of my favorite things is eating. And I wasn't eating that much. I actually... I think I lost something like 20, 30 pounds, and I didn't even know. I mean, it wasn't until I went into the hospital and they weighed me, and you, oh my gosh. So there are a lot of signs. It's just that we have to be able to recognize them. Your words, again, it's so worth it, of, of why you are sharing this. And, and who are you speaking to? I'm speaking to everybody. I'm speaking to those who are suffering. But I'm also speaking to the loved ones around those people who are suffering because we just have to be able to openly talk about this. There is no shame in um, going to, through mental illness. There isn't. I think so many people are. And as you said, with COVID especially, some people have been you know, locked up in their apartment for a year and a half, seeing nobody, um, communication down. It's been a really difficult time, and that's why I think it's more important than ever to talk about what can happen if you don't take care of your mental health. The whispers, it was, people can whisper, whisper, whisper. Um, and when you talked about if you see somebody, someone you love, and, and that person, you may say, Cindy, is everything okay? And you may, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm totally mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. um, but so for that other caring person, don't give up. Mm -hmm. Don't give up in your help. Yes. Because your instincts are almost always right, that there's something wrong. You're so right. And sometimes you don't realize that until it's too late. Duh. So you have to listen to your instincts. And if you think there's a problem, I mean, there, that's the other thing. There's so many resources. Mm -hmm. There are also so many resources that are low cost and free because some people feel like depending on um, their social economic status, they won't have access to help. 
but there is help. There is free help and there is low cost help and you just have to um, reach out for it. Or if you're the loved one of someone who's going through this, the loved one can reach out. There's no shame in asking for help. Yes. It, it is the most simplest of sentences, not necessarily by far the easiest thing to do, but there is no shame in asking for help. Yeah. How is work now? How has it been? Work is good. And the other thing is, uh, when I was at my worst, this is what it felt like visually. Like you're in a dark room and you're smushed against a corner and the darkness is just coming closer and closer and closer and you're t until you practically disappear. Now, I realize what's important in life, you know? And that there are so many people out there that are trained to help you open your life back up and recover and, uh, and talk about it and then be able to talk to other people and help them as well. So work is good. Yeah, time management. I mean, if you feel those buttons pushed, yeah. you have a whole different skill set now yes. on how to say, I'll get this done or mm -hmm. um, like I'll it's, solve this issue with there was no tape. I, I don't right, know, whatever. Right, whatever. it's not that, that's, what life, that's not what life is about. Even if I were to lose my job and to, you know, all these things that you're afraid of happening, it's okay. You know, you're going to survive. And that's when you get better, when you realize that uh, you're going to make it. You're going to get through this with help. But when you're in the midst of uh, a serious depression, you think there is no hope. But there is. When I was leaving uh, treatment, when I was leaving the hospital, you make an emergency plan. So you name three people you're going to call if you are having those feelings. So that it's set up. It's like a system set up. I know I will call my mother. I know I'll call this person and this person. So you have a safety net. Mm. And I think that's part of the process is to um, make sure you have those people in place who can help or be those people who can help, be somebody's safety net. It's, it's life, it's, mm -hmm. it's a plan, it's okay, depression. No, it's, it's a new part of your life. It's not a cloud mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you're managing it. Yes. And even more, I see for you, you're helping others. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanna say that we didn't say? Mm, just that I love you. I love Dana Tyler. Oh, I'm so proud of you. If you or someone you know needs help, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network has a 24-7 crisis hotline. The number 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-8255. You can also text the word TALK to 741-741, and you'll be able to text with a trained crisis counselor, and that's any time for free. Years after Karen survived traumatic chemotherapy and surgery, her breast cancer returned. I had one hope left, the clinical trial. She read everything, called everywhere, until finally Perlmutter Cancer Center invited her into an immunotherapy trial. It was a life changer. Two years later, Karen's tumors are gone, and Perlmutter Cancer Center has more active clinical trials than ever. You get knocked down, and you're, you're looking for hope, and, you know, here was hope. Breaking the Stigma is sponsored by Perlmutter Cancer Center at NYU Langone Health. Cindy, uh, we're back talking here mm -hmm. again to uh, talk to two mental health experts and watching that again is... Uh, it's really emotional. You're amazing. No. You're offering I, I, so I'm much really, to people. I'm really so glad we had the conversation and mm -hmm. it's difficult to have. Um, so that's why we bring in some mental health experts mm -hmm. to get some expert advice. And our first guest, we are joined by Dr. Christine Moutier, who is a psychiatrist and chief medical officer at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Doctor, welcome. Thank you so much, Cindy and Dana, for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. It's wonderful to join you for this story. Thank you, thank you. 
So this whole mental health world is something mm -hmm. I was new to, and I think there's a, a lot of people like that, and I think the terminology, um, you know, psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, what is the difference between these, these people? Well, we are all mental health professionals and go through um, different routes for training. Psychiatrists like myself are medical doctors who go to medical school and um, PhD psychologists and other master's level therapists go to um, their respective uh, graduate schools for training. We are all professionals and we are all about the same thing, which is to help the individual um, and their family, if relevant, understand what is going on and what are the options to regain their optimal mental health. And, and really keeping in mind that mental health is a part of human health, like every other aspect of the body. The brain is a physical organ in the body. Right. And if you have a problem there, if you have a broken leg, you go mm -hmm. get that broken leg yeah. uh, taken care of. Dr. Moutier, one of the things, and, and listening to Cindy and just her thought process, that there is that time, or maybe it's the whole time where you say, I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm going to hold it in. I'm not going to tell anybody. What's the, what could the impact of that be? Well, it is a natural human instinct that when any of us are in pain or especially mental distress, um, feeling uh, you know, like we can't come up with the solution ourselves, unfortunately, our natural instinct is to withdraw and hide that when actually what we need to be doing is reaching out and finding um, the right kind of help. But it's a very, very natural thing that we do. It's important that people realize that so that if your loved one or someone in your life is going through a struggle with their mental health, know that they are probably not just coming right out and talking about it and that it could be that you could be the person who helps draw that out of them by creating a really supportive spa safe space where they know that there will be no judgment and only support and unconditional love. In the interview when I was talking to you, Dana, you know, I talked about the signs for me, which was, mm -hmm. you know, stopping exercise, wanting to sleep all the time. Um, I think the signs are going to be different for everybody, but mm -hmm. Dr. I'm wondering if there are some basic signs that we can look for that says, hey, you know, this person may need help. Yes, if you think about what happens to you or your loved one when you're under a lot of stress and pressure, it might be that your stomach starts getting upset, your back starts to ache, headaches, sleep disruption. Those same symptoms that come from an overload of stress sometimes are the same ones that are the first to start changing as mental health begins to deteriorate. And you know, I think what I want your, your viewers to understand is that, again, because mental health is a part of health, but we haven't really, we're, we're just now catching up with those facts and that science here mm -hmm. in our society. We have been practicing writing off a lot of those signs um, that are really true warning signs for serious deterioration in mental health and kind of saying, hey, let's just, it's just the stress, let's watch and wait, when actually what we could be doing is becoming a much more proactive about what those signs are for each of us. That starts by talking about it um, or asking your loved one if you notice that those changes in sleep behavior, tone of voice, their usual way of engaging in their life just seems off to you. You were so right in the earlier part of your discussion. Mm -hmm. Trust your gut instinct mm -hmm. because the people you know well, your, your gut will tell you when something is not them. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, of course, this is what we're talking about, breaking the stigma. Uh, when you decide you're going to say something to someone um, as a caring as a caring loved one because you've noticed this some of those symptoms that you mentioned I mean what do you say hi how are you doing I mean Cindy and I went went through that mm -hmm. um, in our conversation uh, or do you say as the conversation goes are you thinking about hurting yourself taking your own life could you help us with that Yes, it, I really would encourage everyone um, 
resist the urge to avoid it and just assume someone else is seeing it and we'll check in on them. Assume you're the only one who will reach out and set up a time that is in private, not like a hallway passing, you know, quick or in front of other people type of situation because that really doesn't invite that kind of um, increased level of vulnerability. So I would say, hey, I've noticed X, Y, and Z, and I would be very direct because otherwise they're wondering what is going on. And I would be quick to say, I'm concerned and all I want to do is understand what you're going through if there are things that I can support you and there is no judgment here. So really to set it up in that way and then just ask them the open-ended question. How are you doing? How have things been going? I know there's a lot going on in your life. How, have it, how has it been affecting you? And let them share. And as they share, you will be listening to their words and their tone of voice, those verbal and nonverbal cues. Mm. Be curious, be caring in a loving way. Follow up on the things that they're saying. So if they use words like overwhelmed, like I'm not sure I can do this anymore, get through this. Remember, people with suicidal thoughts will not just put them out there on a silver platter. They will hint at them. That's it, direct, let them talk at that point. And if they share it with you that they have been thinking of suicide, know that many, many people have those thoughts at times. It does not mean we need to panic and call 911 in that moment. It means we listen, we say, oh my goodness, this is affecting you so much. That must be so hard. Tell me more about that. And care for them, love them, just like you would if they had shared some other kind of really serious um, experience. And, and then what I would do is if there's any concern that they're not safe in that moment, that would be the only time that I would engage emergency services. Otherwise, it's really about being their friend, their loved one, whatever your relationship is. Doctor. You know, the word suicide, it's such a, you know, word. And I, I'd heard that if you were to ask someone, if you really think someone's in trouble, that you can say, have you been thinking about having suicidal thoughts? And that that doesn't lead to somebody mm. attempting to take their life. That is correct. There has been a lot of confusion, and I want to try to clear that up. Asking in a caring, non-judgmental, supportive way if somebody's having thoughts of suicide allows them the opportunity. They don't have to take that opportunity, but they might if they are ready. And it might be the first time that they're able to share that they're going through something very intense, but they didn't know who was safe to talk to about it. So it can be extremely helpful and actually the first step in a, in a therapeutic sense of getting the help that they need. Remember that suicidal thoughts are not because they have a morbid preoccupation. It is their, their attempt to try to problem solve. They are feeling desperate and trapped or in pain. And you are allowing them the opportunity to talk about all of that. We can handle this. We talk about a lot of things as friends, colleagues, and family members. The, the process also can be very daunting. If, if someone does have that courage to ask for help and, you know, is it a medication? Is it a talk therapy? And will this lead me to a place mm -hmm. uh, to get psychiatric help where you sleep overnight, you're part of group therapy, what you did. Uh, how, how about helping people understand that to, to not be afraid mm -hmm. of that part of the treatment? You know, what I would say is there are a lot of things that are unknown to us and scary until we try it. And that's true if you were being diagnosed with some kind of physical illness. You wouldn't know everything about what it's going to be like and what those treatment options are, how they'll feel, what they look like. And you have to take that first step. And with mental health, it's no different. It's just that it is the brain that is sick during that period of time. And so it can be even more kind of daunting and and scary and that's why it is so helpful to have supportive family members and colleagues around you who are willing to kind of help support that process that really is how it should be mm -hmm. just like it is for physical illness. I think a lot of people also wonder about the cost 
of treatment. Oh, good point. You know, you hear these astronomical uh, amounts that certain people um, charge. So I'm wondering what kind of low cost and even free resources there are out there. There are low cost and um, even free psychotherapy and treatment available. And what I would say, you do have to find it. If you're a New Yorker, you can contact NYC Well. That is a go-to resource where they have, they will be able to customize their answer to you based on a whole host of factors. But almost every county has something similar. So mm -hmm. I, I would really encourage you the, the, the way to go is to not give up and keep trying. Um, you can start with your primary care doctor. Um, really, anyone who might have experience or answers as to how to start down that path of finding the right person. And I know it is a process, don't give up. But again, I think about the situation of someone with uh, you know, severe diabetes or some other mm -hmm. kind of physical health illness, you would do the same thing. You would not give up until you find the right health provider, right treatment plan that is working. And we can, we can do that for our mental health as well. Doctor, as we uh, begin to wrap up, tell me what you think about my friend and her courage. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, Cindy is my hero. Um, <laughs> she went through so much and um, thank goodness um, you all and her family um, were there for her and she was able to start talking about it. She found the, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, our organization's New York City chapter. Those resources are there for others who are struggling and not sure where to go as well. You can go to AFSP.org to learn more. But I am um, in huge admiration of, of Cindy for speaking out. And I just want people to know that Cindy is, is brave. She's not the only one. Yeah. There are one in four Americans who are going through similar types of mental health experiences and we just need to um, shine a light and take the stigma out of out of these topics because they're really these these are health issues just like um, all aspects of human health just like we've been talking about. Dr. Moutier thank you so much I'm humbled by both of you and thank you for your expertise. Um, much appreciated. We just have to keep talking. Mm -hmm. Thank you thank you so much Dr. Moutier. Absolutely thank you. Again, if you or someone you know needs help, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network has a 24-7 crisis hotline. Again, the number 1-800-273-TALK-8255. You can also text the word TALK to 741-741 to text with a trained crisis counselor anytime for free. She was, that was so informative, yeah. wasn't it? It really it's is. Really helpful. And, um, I wish we could hear more about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Well, we can hear from yes, somebody else. Yes, exactly. Now we are joined by Dr. Donald Grant, a psychologist. He is the executive director at Mindful Training Solutions. Doctor, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. You've done stories with Dr. Yes. Grant. And uh, Dr. Grant, also you've been part of uh, speaking with all of us mm -hmm. groups here at CBS2. We appreciate that. Uh, and, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, you're very helpful, as I know you will be right now, too, as we're talking about breaking the stigma. And one of those being a person who has mental illness or suicidal thoughts. It's like, well, that person must be X and fit in this block box. Couldn't be further from the truth. Couldn't be further from the truth. The thing is, if you have a brain, you have mental health concerns. And I think that's some of the level set that we need to have is that people need to understand no matter what it looks like from the outside. If you're human, there are risk factors for mental wellness. Doctor, you know, I talked about in our in our discussion how um, sometimes communities of color may have be less likely to talk about mental health. And it, you know, it takes a while to find that person that is a good fit to help you. I'm wondering if there's some certain things we should be asking psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists that we, we may think, we may be thinking of working with. 
Yeah, it's so important, particularly if you're a person of color, because we know that many of the mental health clinicians out there um, are not of color, and we need to work hard to get more clinicians of color. But what we know, we want to ask things like, have you ever worked with anybody from my cultural background? Um, have you had training in you know, cultural competency or cultural empathy, as I like to call it? Mm. Um, you know, how will our cultures impact our engagement and my treatment? And finally, things like how will you incorporate, you know, different parts of my own culture, my traditions? How will you work to incorporate that into my treatment? Talk about blame and shame. Uh, mm -hmm. Be it I'm blaming myself for not doing X, Y, Z, and then on the other side, say a relative of another generation says, "Oh my gosh, it's my fault. The way I raised the child." Uh, talk about that and how everybody um, can give themselves a break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shame and blame are such a big, such big factors in mental health services and just approach from the consumer point of view when you want to go see a therapist and then approach from the familial point of view where parents and family members say, oh, it was my fault. Um, we give a lot of other people more grace than we give ourselves. And so I think it's really important to provide ourselves with some grace. Now, it's also important to be very honest. Some of us have really created environments that have brought up forth some risk factors for the people in our worlds. And we really want to acknowledge those so that we can do different, right? And so sometimes we're raising kids in an environment that does that is riddled with many different risk factors and we try to put things in place to balance that out for instance when we think about the disproportionate number of children who experience poverty we know that a lot of those parents can't do anything about that at the moment but you do have to recognize that there may be risk factors associated with that environment that we want to mediate that we want to take time to sit with our children and fill them with courage and strength if they live in an environment where they're not getting that automatically. And so we got to give ourselves grace, but we also have to acknowledge what really exists. When you talk about grace, Dr. Grant, uh, speak a little more on that, because isn't there a fine line between giving ourselves grace mm -hmm. and not telling somebody I need help? That is such an important point. So sometimes, because mental wellness has a taboo, no matter who you are, white, black, Latinx, Asian American, Persian, there is a stigma about it. So we want to make sure that when we're talking about grace, we're paying attention to our own insecurities about not just the mental health of our loved ones, but about our own. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we're like, I'm not gonna push that person because I'm sitting here in my own fog or I'm sitting here in my own addiction or my own depression. And we have a resistance to actually pushing someone and say, oh, we'll give them some grace. The grace I was speaking of is making Making sure we're not too blaming of ourselves mm -hmm. on this road, but we have to ask these hard questions. We have to ask our loved ones, are you in pain? Do you want to hurt yourself? Here's an even tougher one. Do you want to kill yourself? Remember, do you want to hurt yourself and do you want to kill yourself are two very different questions. There are some people who have experienced suicidal ideations who never wanted to hurt themselves, but they certainly wanted to die. And we have to reduce the myth that demonstrates, that has historically demonstrated, that when we ask someone about suicide, it increases the likelihood that they'll engage in suicidal behaviors. That's been proven scientifically to not to not to be true. We have to be brave, we have to be bold, and we have to understand that a lot of our engagement on this may be based on our own stuff. And so even though it's an overused analogy, the whole put on your oxygen mask before you put on someone else's, it's so relevant in this situation because we need people in order to keep somebody else safe who may be in a very precarious situation, we gotta work on our own stuff as well. That's so true, doctor. You know, when we were uh, talking about when we don't have supportive people around us, how, and very often, as you said, it's young people who don't have a supportive parent or somebody to go to, what advice do you have for them? Well, we have to recognize some of these statistics, right? We understand that between the ages of 18 and 25 are some of the largest mental health concerns with that group. And they are some of the lowest um, 
participants in mental health services across across all ethnicities and culture cultures. What we want to do is try to front load all of our children who we work with, who we teach, who we engage with. We want to provide them with tools to be able to regulate, self-regulate, engage in anger management, all these different things, such that at 18 to 25, when all, when these onsets of so many different disorders happen, they're not left untooled. They're not left without skills, and we want to be able to provide them with some of them. And if we can do our best at putting protective factors in that environment, remember, some environments we can't change. Mm. I get that. But we can add protective factors to that environment. Like when we think about people who do certain jobs, they wear protective gear for that job. If you live in a community that is riddled with certain risk factors, we want to do a different job in our home to make sure the people are safe. Whether that means making sure that kids have books where they see themselves and they gain that additional layer of self-esteem so that when they're moving through a, a community that's riddled with substances um, of abuse, mm -hmm. they may have a higher degree, degree of self-esteem because they have all these books that they read growing up that look like where they had characters that look like them. Now, I'm not suggesting that reading a book can stop substance abuse. But what I am suggesting is the, the synergy between all these different things that we do can increase the likelihood of safety in our communities. You spoke about job uh, work, our different environments. And Cindy, mm -hmm. a perfect example of someone um, you know, high pressure, high exposure job. And again, just saying that this can happen to anybody, can have suicidal yeah. thoughts. Um, one of the things you speak to groups as a whole, um, and talking about work stresses, and, and just could you address those just a little bit more? Some of us move into the workspace and we have to consistently wear this mask, this mask of efficacy, um, this mask that demonstrates that we don't have a weak moment. Um, and that can be very dangerous, particularly when you're going through one of your vulnerable moments, again, which everybody has. There's not one person um, who doesn't experience those. A lot of things that I do with workplaces is I help people understand how do we, in fact, curate a workplace where people can bring their full selves to work. We often Sometimes talk about that in the framework of, you know, ethnicity and culture, but just as big as bringing your full cultural self to work is bringing your full emotional self to work. We want leaders of the workplace to be able to engage with their um, teams in a way that says, I don't need you to tell me about all of your mental health concerns because now we're in a HIPAA, a HIPAA violation, but I do want you to be able to feel safe enough and feel safe enough that you have job security that you can take off work when you need to. That you don't feel like if I go on this sabbatical, I'm going to lose my job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Doctor, I, I just want to ask you very quickly, you know, we're all coming out of the pandemic and some yeah. people going back to work. Everyone is anxious. What are some things that anyone can do to help feed their good mental health? Yeah, and that, that that's a great that's a great point. Like so many people are walking into this new open world and some are feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, some are feeling like, oh, you know, I'm gonna be very tentative about going in, but I don't feel anxious about it. So first thing is honoring your own individualized experience, right? You don't wanna let the noise around you dictate how you feel. You wanna determine that for yourself. So that's the first thing then you recognize, wow, I am feeling anxious, not just because the world is telling me I should feel anxious, but because I really do. And so moving very slowly into this reopening is gonna be a very valuable tool for a lot of people. Recognizing the pressure that's coming to you externally and acknowledging it. I think one of the major components with anxiety is kind of the thought of the event and we catastrophize a lot. When we take moments, moment by moment and day by day, we have the opportunity to prepare a little bit more for it. And so I think that it's gonna be very important as people look towards going back into their workplaces, going back into shopping malls, sitting inside areas where people are not wearing masks and you don't feel comfortable with that, making deliberate decisions on what you've recognized, not the noise around, but would you take an individual stock in for yourself, because I think that's the key. There's so much noise around the reopening that people are not necessarily authentically having their own experience. And I want people to sit with themselves and figure out their own cadence 
and move in that way. That's gonna help reduce a lot of that anxiety. Good advice, really helpful, thank you. <laughs> Doctor, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, You've helped us so much, as we were saying, you know, <laughs> previously with other stories and just all your expertise. I, I thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure to be with you all. I was it's nervous. Great, right? I was nervous about all of this. You did great. Uh, well, I have to just say, I'm so, I'm so grateful. Are you gonna cry? I know again, <laughs> but I, I'm so grateful That's that. Fun. You are here to have this important conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful to everyone out there who's taking the time to watch this. And I just hope that we open up, we share our issues, we help each other, and there is, we need to break the stigma. And that we open up and that we, um, when we need help, mm -hmm. we have, feel empowered if, if you can find a, any bit of that yeah. during that tough time but also for the others in your lives, that we are observant of other people mm -hmm. and maybe get our faces out of the technology a little bit. Oh, definitely. Helping, I'm so glad you're here. How long have we known each other? Boy, 20. I know I've been here 28 years, so 28 <laughs> years. Well, 30 <laughs> years. <laughs> we are really good friends. Uh, we are. Um, we were talking about um, Resources. Resources. And first of all, again, thank you for being with us. We do have more resources on how to find help on our website, cbsnewyork.com. You are not alone. There is always help available. If you or someone you know needs help, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Network has a 24-7 crisis hotline. That's 1-800-273-TALK. 1-800-273-8255. You can also text the word TALK to 741-741 to text with a trained crisis counselor anytime for free, which can lead to further help. And I want to say one more thing. There's nothing wrong with crying. That's very true. And I'm, I'm good at that. <laughs> Take good care. <laughs>